So we're going to continue from where we left off last time, chapter Lamed Zion 37. It's a long chapter, so we're doing now the second half. The second half actually has many important ideas that define Hashkafa. Hashkafa is the Jewish perspective. One of the perspectives that people have a very difficult time with that this chapter covers is Maduat Sadiq Beral or Hashavetolbo. Many people are bothered by the fact that they observe how the wicked, those who are not doing that which is right and proper, are prospering, are successful, where the righteous, those who are following the book, following the rules, and observing the commandments, are struggling. They have a hard time with topics of this nature, especially something like the Holocaust, where so many innocent people lost their lives. A million children, of the six million, they say it was a million children who perished. And what did they do wrong? So this has troubled mankind for forever. And in Tehillim, a lot of it is discussed at length. Some of it appears to be repetition, but it's always adding some more information. David HaMelech always adds an additional uh, perspective that clarifies the topic more and more. In the second half, however, he discusses briefly what the qualities of a rasha is. Before he tells us a little bit about the rasha'im, what, what, what is awaiting them in the future, he describes to us an example of a rasha, a rasha, a wicked man. There's all kinds of evil out there. There's a lot of wicked people, but what defines a rasha? There's chata'im, there are sinners. There's rasha'im, the wicked. There's all kinds of words that describe these individuals who cause harm to others, troublemakers, and so forth. And here he gives us an example that you would never think falls under the category of Rasha, but it's very important that he points this out because it, it, it describes the inner nature of certain individuals. Inner nature meaning that which is not necessarily observable on the outside. Nonetheless, because of his behavior, because of certain acts that this individual does, it puts him in the category of a rasha. So, who is this individual? Pasukaf Aleph, that is where we're holding, Lover Rasha, Veloy Shalem, Betzadik Honen Venotim. That is Pasuk verse Kaf Aleph. So, this wicked man, what does he do? He borrows money and does not pay. A borrower who intentionally, knowingly, does not even intend to pay. In other words, he knows this in advance. He's going to borrow the money, and he's not going to repay it. Yeah. Whereas the righteous man, Honen Venoten, is just opposite. He's gracious. He's giving two very opposite individuals. Now, how do we know that this individual is so bad? What makes him such an evil individual? Just because he borrows and doesn't repay, I mean, he's a thief. But what makes him a rasha? So if you recall in Pirkei Avot, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakai had various students whom he asked to suggest what is the most important quality that one should pursue, that one should strive to develop, that will help him out a lot in life. And he also asked them, what should one stay away from? What is a poor quality, something that one should never God forbid, acquire. So one opinion there, one of the students expressed the following, Rabbi Shimon said, one who borrows money and does not repay, which is very interesting. Now, this rabbi's positive suggestion was what? What should you pursue? What should you adapt? Ezu chacham haro'e tanulad. In other words, who is a wise man? the one that sees the future, one that sees the consequences of his actions. So Rabbi Shimon, in describing a positive quality, was saying that an individual should always see into the future, should always weigh the pros and cons of everything he does, should not act impetuously, but should evaluate something before he does it. So that we can understand that. That's very special. That is the right thing to do to consider one's actions, to consider them before you, you, you do them. You don't want to regret what you did. 
So what does it have to do with the opposite? The negative quality doesn't seem to be related to the positive. Each one of the students says something positive and something negative. But it is the exact opposite because if one borrows and does not plan to repay, it is indicative that he's not looking into the future. It's indicative that he's not considering what's going to happen in the future that nobody's going to want to lend him. But it's worse than that. It's not just a matter of lending. It's that people are going to be very, very scared. They're going to hesitate. They're not going to want to lend money to others because there's a lot of liars out there, a lot of thieves that don't return the money. So this is a bad example. So this Rasha is causing a lot of harm through this kind of a behavior. Not only is he not returning the money that he borrowed, but what kind of an example is he going to set for others? Others are going to be afraid to do the same, to lend money. But why would he not want to return the money? Why do we classify him as a Rasha? What makes him a Rasha? Just because he takes money, somebody else's money, doesn't return it? It tells us a lot about this individual. It tells us about how ungrateful he is. When one does not return a favor, I mean, that's what a loan is, isn't it? When one does not return a favor, he's ungrateful. It's not just about being irresponsible, because he intentionally is doing it. So it's about ungratefulness. It's about cruelty. What if that the guy who lent the money really needs the money? It's about ich patiyut, as we would say in Hebrew, a lack of sensitivity in one who does not care about another individual. It's selfishness, no shame whatsoever. And look at the harm he causes others who need money and no one's going to want to lend them because they suspect that this guy maybe is one of those who will never return the money. And this is also mentioned in the Midrash. Midrash mentions that there are three individuals that can be called Rashaim, wicked people. One who, who hits, even if he didn't hit, he just raised his hand to hit another human being, is called Rasha. One who borrows and does not pay is in that list as well. He's called Rasha. And number three, one who's a Bal Machloket, one who's always picking a fight, always getting into arguments. Bal Machloket causing divisiveness, causing fights with people, instead of trying to find a compromise, a peaceful resolution to a problem. If he intentionally wants to stir up a machloket, a fight, he's called rasha. Anyway, so what is the root here of the problem? Why do people act this way? So we said they're selfish, but there's more to that. An individual who does not make a blessing, the rabbis tell us, before he eats something, does not appreciate what God has given him. It's like he's stealing from Hashem. So an individual who takes from others, it's the same idea. He does not understand that whatever Hashem gives, we have to appreciate. Whatever other people give us, we also need to appreciate. Appreciating that which we did not have, that we have now, is a very important midah. Without this basic midah of appreciating something, we think it's coming to us somehow. The appreciating helps us not to believe that something is coming to us. On the contrary, we feel indebted. That someone gave us something that perhaps we don't have the privilege, we don't have the merit of having. So somehow we're, we're supposed to be thankful and we're supposed to communicate that to the individual when we say thank you, which is what a blessing is all about. When we make blessings, whether before we put something in their mouth or whether it's after, whether it's after we exit the restroom, all the different types of blessings we have is to show our appreciation, we don't take anything for granted. So therefore, one who lacks these characteristics, these qualities, is really, really behind. And it transforms him into a, a wicked person because he wants everything for himself. Whereas the tzaddik is just the opposite. The righteous man, not only does he give back what he took, he gives on his own, he's generous. It's not only about giving back what you took, which is obviously something that's expected of you, but he's honen, he's gracious, he's generous, he empathizes with those who, who need help, he's sensitive, 
and therefore he gives of himself. My father told me a story that happened when he was a young boy. There was an individual who owed my grandfather money. And whenever my grandfather would see him and would ask him, so when are you going to pay back the debt? He would always say he doesn't have, he doesn't have any money. So one time my grandfather asked his kids, they were children, so what do you say? What should I do? Do you believe him? So they said, well, if he says he doesn't have money, he doesn't have the money. Yes, he probably doesn't have the money. He says, no, there's no such thing. If you really want to repay a loan and you're sincere, you pay back one dollar a week. You whatever you can. If you're never making any effort whatsoever to pay back even a small amount, that's indicative that you don't want to repay back the loan. Not that you don't have. There's not such a thing that you don't have anything. Nothing whatsoever. How do you live? How do you survive? You can afford something, according to your means, of course, according to your abilities. Not to return anything, not to make an effort, not to try even a little bit, that is a sign that this man is lying. He's not planning on returning the money. And I have some, some bad news for you. There's a lot of people like that, unfortunately. Be careful. Yeah, unfortunately, you can't just trust anyone. So what's going to be? No one's going to ever be able to get a loan. My rule of thumb is, and this is taken from Michelet, which we've covered several years ago, Solomon advises, listen, never put yourself in a situation that you're going to regret. So never give more money than you, what you're willing to forfeit. If you can live with the loss, then go ahead and give it. Nothing's going to happen. But if it's, if it's going to give you a heart attack, the day you hear that your money's not coming back, then don't do it. Regardless of who that individual is, it makes no difference. If you think that there's a 50-50 chance that the money's not coming back, unless you're willing to consider it charity and forget about it, then don't give it. There's no obligation to take risks in life. The Torah doesn't tell you to take a risk. On the contrary, the halakha says, make sure there are witnesses. You better have witnesses, otherwise you are at fault. You better sign a contract. No matter who this man is, no matter how many times he's giving you back the money, maybe he's going to die and the children won't know anything about it. You always want to be on the safe side. Next pasuk. Ki mevorachav yirirsho aretsu mekulalav yikaretu. Those that are blessed by Hashem will inherit the land, will inherit the earth, and those who are cursed will be cut off. What is he adding over here? He's telling us that the ma'asim, it is the deeds of a person that cause him to be blessed by Hashem, or the opposite, God forbid. It's the deeds. A blessing has to do with deeds. There is something called mazal. There is something called fate or destiny, or in Farsi, qismat. Yeah, that you were born with, that you have from the time of birth, that may have something to do with the previous lifetime. So an individual comes back in a reincarnation, there's some connection to a previous life. He may be in a good mazal. Nothing to do with his deeds. Regardless, he could be an evil man, but he has good mazal. He could be a righteous man, but the mazal is, is a mazal of struggle. Mazal is what pretty much dictates a great deal of our life, except for the area where we have free will. There is an area of free will, and that is whether one will be righteous or not, or sinful. Do a good deed or do a bad deed. When it comes to bad and good, that's where free will reigns. When it comes to who you marry, what kind of kids you have, what kind of a livelihood you will have, all of this is part of the mazal. And that we don't have too much control over. Even though we do have a tradition that one can change his mazal through repentance, through prayer, charity. Yes, there are times when one succeeds in doing that. But otherwise, a great deal of our life is controlled by the mazal. But here David Amelech reminds us that blessings, blessing is not something that comes with the baby. You know, he hasn't done anything yet to deserve a blessing. Unless it could be there are times where the father is blessed, and we will soon see that too. And that blessing transfers over to his children and grandchildren. That does exist. A real blessing actually can last for many, many generations. But simply stated, a blessing is something that one earned through something special that he did. 
something very special. And that's what David Amelef says, that when it comes to Berachot, they will inherit the land. In other words, they will be established. They will have tranquility and peace of mind. That's what that means. And those, God forbid, who are cursed, Yikareto, in the end, they will be cut off. Why is he telling that to us? And we already know that from before. But he's reminding us that you're only seeing a piece of history or a piece of an individual's life. You haven't seen his entire life. He may be okay now. Well, what, what's going to happen 30 years from now? You may not be around to see it. But the Vietnamese reassures us, someone who's evil, the curse will eventually catch up with them. Yikaretu, they will be cut off. Nothing lasts forever. Unless it's a blessing. A blessing can last. can last for a long time. So the real individuals who are, the, the, the ones who are blessed from Hashem, they will inherit the land. Next pasuk. Very important concept. And this has a little bit to do with what we just said. The steps of man are directed by Hashem. The steps that he takes, the path that he, he takes. It's all directed from Hashem, from God. God desires his way. God planned it out like that. That's the way he wishes it to be. What steps are we talking about? Well, if you had to end up going to a particular city, if you had to take a certain job, if you had to meet someone, that path, that journey is from Shammai. You usually take the 101 freeway, and for some reason you don't know, but this morning you took the 405. That's from Shammai. It could be directed, directly connected to one's mazal too. Or it could be that that morning, through divine providence, through Ashgacha Pratit, Hashem says, you know what, I'm going to make it that you avoid a potential danger or an accident, and therefore I put it into your mind to take a different route. So we think we're deciding, that's not our decision. May Hashem, he says, it all, it's all from Shemaim. Because that's what he wishes for man to do. What's not, Mishamayim? So there's a Gemara that says, in a way that an individual wants to go, they direct him. In the, in the way that an individual wants to go, in other words, he has the, the right to choose. Yes, when we're talking about the direction, the path of being righteous or evil, that you decide. They let you go. You want to be wicked? You want to choose this path? You want to go along this path? They'll let you go. They won't stop you. That is not going to be redirected because Hashem has a different plan. No. Listen. You want to commit suicide by smoking two packs of cigarettes a day? Then you're cutting down your life. According to your mazal, the gift of life was meant to be for 82 years, let's say. It could be shortened to 50, God forbid. That's the way the man wants to go. That's up to him. That's a free will. Smoking is just one example. There's other examples where people can destroy their lives. If man chooses to ruin his life, they won't stop him. So where do they direct him? They direct him in general, who he's going to marry, unless he misbehaves. If a person misbehaves, then that's also put on hold. That's part of ma'asim. The ma'asim of an individual, we're not puppets. We are, we're human beings endowed with a certain amount of free will. And if we make wrong decisions and we don't make amends, in other words, we don't repair them through teshuva, then that can affect our life. So even one's mazal can be ruined. He had a good mazal, but it's ruined. Or things are postponed and delayed because of our actions. People who are very picky when it comes to marriages can also be postponing indefinitely. Who knows till when? You have to be careful not to be overly picky because life is short. And Hashem says, listen, I prepared her for you when you were 23, 24. But you chose to get a PhD in sociology or whatever. You know, she's not going to wait for you. You know, marriage is a priority. Marriage comes first. Then you can continue to learn. Not everybody understands this. Their, their thinking is, well, I have to be able to afford a home. I have to be able to buy a house. I have to be able to do this and I have to do this. By the time everything is settled, he's over 50. He's balding and he has a belly. Who's going to want to marry him then? 
Right? So it's not a good idea to push off uh, the marriage, you know, until everything is just right. I have enough money to pay for the wedding. I have enough money to buy a house. Or, you don't push it off. So these are ma'asim. These are deeds that can cause trouble. So we have two paths. We have the path that they choose from above. And if you veer off, it's like the GPS recalculates, gets you back on track. Don't worry about it. Eventually, most of the time, you're going to end up going where you're supposed to be going, living where you're supposed to be living, meeting the people you're supposed to be meeting. But when it comes to spiritual path, to be a good person or a bad person, that, the derech shadam you want to go and be like that? They won't stop you. That's the difference between the two paths. There's a Zohar and there's a Gemara that also says as follows, and this is pretty much the similar idea. Ragloi de bar inashinun arvile, latar de midbain taman moviliente. That's an Aramaic uh, description of what we just said. That the feet of one are like his co signers, his guarantors. They take him wherever they belong. In other words, your feet will take you to wherever they need to be. You, you basically have no control over those feet. Another idea, however, behind the last few words here, the Tarko Yechpatz that Hashem desires that way. What does it mean that Hashem desires that way? Even though the path appears to us to be something that is difficult, something that doesn't make too much sense to us, but we, don't, we don't understand why we ended up going in a certain direction. Just remember, Hashem willed it so. He wants it. You know, it's not that it's random, it's not that it, there was a mistake here. Hashem yachpatz. Hashem wants certain things to be in a certain way. So as long as, as long as you're doing everything right, for example, and your soulmate hasn't arrived, that's because he chose not to send her yet, or not to send him. If you're doing everything right, it just could be that the time hasn't come yet. That's what he wants. Unless, of course, it's one of those things where we made a decision in a bad decision, that could ruin the situation as well. But otherwise, we're supposed to believe that that's what he wants. That's the way he wanted it. He wanted you to be in this house. Oh, I should have bought that house. Oh, I should have done this. No, these are things beyond our control. That's the way he wanted it to be. And therefore, that must be somehow in our best interest. We may not know how, but Hashem Yechpatz, you know, was Darko Yechpatz. <coughs> that is the path that Hashem wants for us. Another idea here, before we go on, is that Darko Yechpatz, that if a person behaves himself and does everything correctly, then everything will align itself properly. Everything will go right. In other words, as long as we don't intentionally do something wrong, then everything will go fine. Everything will work out. Everything will fall into place. Next pasuk. Ki yipol lo yutal ki Adonai sumech yado. Alright, let's say someone does fall. We just said that Hashem guides. Guides us. But what if in the midst of our journey we fall? So he says that when a person appears to be falling, he will not be thrown down completely. Ki yipol lo yutal. Hashem will hold on to his hand and will not make him fall completely. This is seen many, many times in life when people were, on the, as they say in English, on the brink of disaster. It could be an illness, the cancer. Chaz v'shalom, God forbid, that everybody gave up on them. Hashem says, I don't know what you guys are thinking, but he's supposed to be around for another 20 years. And sure enough, after a while, the illness goes away, and it's fine, as though he never had anything. There have been countless stories like that. So, ki pol, whether it's financial or an illness, lo yutal, not necessarily will that person fall all the way. Ki Hashem, so maybe Hashem is holding on to him. If in the end he succumbs, well, that was willed from Hashem as well. But... He, who are we talking about here? We're not just talking about the average individual. We're talking about Sadiqim here. Good people, righteous people, 
And on them it is said, ki polo yutal, not just for anyone. So such an, <coughs> such an individual you may think, you know, is struggling. Yes, he may be struggling, but ki polo yutal, he's not going to fall down all the way. Hashem somech yado, Hashem will hold on to him. Next pasuk is a famous verse that we say also in Birkat Amazon, in the blessing that we say when we can when we finish eating bread. Sounds familiar? I was young once upon a time, we all were, right? Gam Zakanti, I've become older, aged, and I've never seen David says, I've never seen a righteous man being abandoned completely, forsaken, nor did I see Zar Omevakesh Lachem that his seed, his offspring, his children would be begging for bread? In other words, even though it's true, <clears throat> in the past it was even more true than today. Today, the, the lifestyle is very, very different than in the past where people were really poor and sometimes did not have anything to eat for dinner. They went to sleep hungry. Nonetheless, he says, I've never seen Sadiq, a real righteous man that will be forsaken completely. You know what forsaken means? Forsaken is a very, very strong word. That means Hashem has forsaken him, abandoned him completely, has nothing more to do with him. Chaz Vashem, God forbid, says, I've never seen such an individual. Somehow, he got the help he needed at the last moment. He could have been having a hard time, yes, but for completely forsaken, no. Somehow, he got help when he needed it. Neither did I see his children begging for bread, as though they, you know, without this little bit of bread, they're going to die, God forbid. David Amel is saying, I've never seen something like that, except, of course, at a time of war. I mean, there are situations where people, you know, are in complete, uh, how should we say, uh, they are in, in despair. In other words, they are in a situation which is very dire, very, very serious. Famine all kinds of situations where people uh, lose their lives because of that. We're not talking about extreme situations here. He says, in general, you may see someone struggling if he's a real tzaddik, if he's a real tzaddik, that's the condition here. He says tzaddik, a righteous man. I've never seen such a situation where he will be completely forsaken and nobody cares about him. God provides even for animals, for all his creatures. He's not gonna provide for mankind. As man is the, the crown of his creation the most special creature of all, unless this man misbehaves, of course. That is when we see a lack of rain, we see trouble, problems, earthquakes, and the like. But otherwise, a tzaddik, a real tzaddik, we don't even know what a real tzaddik is yet. We've learned a little bit about what a rasha is, what a wicked man is. But what about a tzaddik? We'll see So, It's not just about being righteous and good and kind. There's more to it. So he's talking about a tzaddik. Tzaddik is not forsaken. <clears throat> One can add that perhaps he's also saying, that when he adds the words that neither did I see his children begging for bread, that as a result of a tzaddik's ma'asim, as a result of his righteous deeds, his children inherit that merit, and therefore they won't necessarily suffer in the merit of their father. So in the merit of a tzaddik's, his children do well as... In other words, the paracha continues along with them as well. The next pasuk, also very interesting, and I think it ties in very well with the saying in various languages that goes something like this. The shoemaker's children run barefoot. Have you heard of that? Yeah. Uh, there's similar sayings in other languages. Now somehow, even though he makes shoes for everybody, his own children don't have. It turns out that many, many times teachers, rabbis, are so busy and are so involved with the community that they may not have that same time that they're giving to others for their own family members. So what would you think that here they're giving so much of themselves to others and the home will be deprived of the attention that his own children need and they will suffer. God forbid, but the answer is no. One who gives to others, the Khatam Sofer, 
bless memory, says this in one of his books, I think in an introduction. He mentions this pasuk. You may think that one who does for others and gives so much of his time and attention to others, to help others, and as a result of that, his kids are being left out. You may think that his kids will really be left out. No. This pasuk fits in beautifully with what will happen. Pasuk Avav. Kol hayom chonenu malve. If a person all day long is kind and lends money, in other words, gives the attention to others, vezar olev his offspring are going to be a blessing. In other words, his offspring, his children will not suffer as a result of that. If he is kind and giving to others, giving all that time and help to others, his children will not be barefoot. No. His children will not be lacking just because he took the time to give to others. Hashem will somehow take care of them. They will grow up to be good kids. This does not exempt one from doing zero. For his kids, obviously you have to do whatever you can to educate, to raise. Parents have a certain responsibility, of course. But in case for some reason it was left out because he gave to others, no. Nope. livracha, his children will be a blessing. Next pasuk. Sur leolam. This is a pasuk that we saw before, similar that there is two requirements to be a good person, to be a tzaddik. If you want to strive to do the right thing, it requires first sur mira. Sur mira means stay away. Stay away from doing that which is evil. And do good. Let's say somebody just does good, but he still does evil too. No, it cannot be. They're incompatible, it's a contradiction. To really be a good person, there can be no evil. It's not that person is a Robin Hood. You know, he takes from some and gives to others. It's not that he's charitable, but he also lies. You can't. You have to stay away from that which is Ra and do good. To be a, a complete tzaddik, a completely righteous person, involves both steps. First, is Sur Mira, to control your, your bad habits, to rein them in, and to do good. Then, Ushchol Leolam. Ushchol Leolam, that means, and then you will dwell in peace forever. It was then you will have a certain sense of completeness, where you will have, we have a certain self-control. When a person has a self-control, that means that he is in control of his evil inclination. He is the master, not the slave. Therefore, he has that tranquility, that peace of mind. When one is a slave of the Yetzer Allah, the evil inclination means that he has not controlled himself, whether it's in anger or stinginess or whatever it may be, then he's a slave. And he, he still has the Ra in him. He's incomplete. He's Pagum, in a sense, he's like defective. There's something not complete in him. So in order to think of a diet, it's not that you are on a diet a whole day, but at night you cheat or in the weekends you cheat. I mean, it doesn't really work well like that. Either you are or you're not in a diet. So it has to be surmira. You have to control that which is harmful, that which is not good for your soul or for your body. And aseto, and then shkhon leolam, then you can rest in peace. <laughs> rest in peace meaning that you can have that tranquility or that completeness that you are striving to get. He goes on to describe a tzaddik now. What makes a tzaddik a tzaddik? Ki Adonai oheb mishpat velo ya'azov et chasidav le'olam nishmaru v'zera rishayim nichrat. What does Hashem like? What does Hashem look for? He looks for, he looks for mishpat. He loves justice. So he will not abandon those who are pious, the chasidav. Le'olam nishmaru, he will always protect them. What are we talking about when we say protection? We're talking about Ashgacha Pratit, we're talking about divine providence. They have, they're recorded a special Shemira, special protection. Not everyone, not everyone gets that special protection. Who does? One who is Ohev Mishpat. Since God loves the justice, one who is just, one who's upright, one who is fair, it's all included in Mishpat with others. 
Hashem offers him special protection. He does not abandon those who are pious. What's pious? What is pious? What, what makes someone a pious person? Anybody know? Rabbis introduced to us the term Lifni Meshurat Adin. You know, it was doing something beyond one's duty. More than what you have to do. Chassid, being extra careful, being more giving than the average, that's called a Chassid, being extra careful. So here we have an, a situation where a person loves to do the right thing. He wants to, to do which, that which is right in the eyes of Hashem, that which is mishpat, that which is correct. That's the exact opposite of a Rasha, who doesn't care about what the rules are. He has his own rules. He breaks others' rules. So he says, Hashem will have mishpat. Hashem loves the fact that an individual wants to abide by the, by the rules and is disciplined and does what is correct, not what he wants. And therefore, he will not abandon his chasidav, those who are pious. He will always offer them that special protection. Whereas, v'zera rashaim nichrat, those who are the children of the wicked will be cut off. In other words, they will not have that kind of a protection. So if you don't have that kind of a protection, anything can happen. God forbid if somebody is involved in an accident. You want all the shemira possible, all the protection that you can. One who's at war. The rabbis tell us not everybody wanted to go out to war if they sensed they had some sins. And those sins will accuse them at time of danger, because when you are in a dangerous situation, the books are open and they are examined. Should we perform a miracle on his behalf? Should we protect him? Should we save him? So there's a big difference between one who's Oev Mishpat, a Hasid, and those that are the Shaim, whether they will live through it or not, whether they will be given that protection. I think the Zohar, I think the Zohar says that this Pasuk is talking about Yosef. Yosef was thrown into jail, and it was a whole bunch of lies. It doesn't appear that he deserved it, right? Even though everything is Mishamayim. So don't look at that period of time that he was in jail. Look at what happened to him later on. Didn't he come out of jail eventually? And not only did he come out, he eventually, Allah Lekdula, he became the viceroy in Egypt, second in command. So you see? In the end, Hashem took care of him. He did not abandon him. Because everything is b'mishpat. B'mishpat means that there is a reason for everything. Everything is according to the attribute of justice. And there are times that even good people need to pay for certain things that they may have done wrong. So hopefully what they're paying or going through is temporary. Just wait and see, he says. In the end, all these good people, if they're really good, they'll come out of it. Just that we have to be patient. <laughs> you know, we have to look at, a, at an entire life of an individual to see what, what eventually became of him. We can't just analyze 10 years or even 20 years of his life. But no one can necessarily claim, easily claim such a title that he's a tzaddik. What do we know? Only Hashem knows who he is. But hopefully we assume that a person is doing everything right, 100%, especially if he's fair in business, honest, truthful, a righteous man, helps others, there's no reason to doubt that this, is a, this individual is a tzaddik or a chassid, and that Hashem will protect him. So even though he may be struggling, hopefully that will be just momentarily. At the end he says, Tzaddikim yirshu aretz v'yishkenu la'ad aleha. This is talking more about the end of days, Olam Abba, perhaps also the world to come, that the righteous will inherit the land and they will settle, settle there forever. Whenever we see the word forever, where is forever? Where is the eternal life? Olam Abba. That's why I'm saying that it's very possible that he is referring to the next world, the world to come, or the world as we will know it soon when Mashiach comes that there will be peace in the entire world, and those that remain will be the righteous, not the wicked. So those that remain, those that will inherit the land, those that will be around, will be the tzaddikim. So what we see today is just an illusion in a sense. 
It's a mixture of all kinds of people. But that is this temporary world, Olam Amasim, the world of deeds. When we come to the Olam of Tikkun, Olam that already has a Tikkun, that everything has been repaired, Mashiach has come, where the evil inclination is banished completely, then obviously it would be a different kind of world where whoever remains is one who deserves to enjoy the world to come. Whether it's the number of years that remain from the 6,000 years, which is this physical world, or whether it's what comes after that, the eternal world, Olam Abba. Who will remain? The Tzadikim. Next, Pi Tzadik Yehgeh Chochmah Ulshonot Edaber Mishmah, continue on to talk about it. Tzadik. A tzadik is not one, only one who is complete in himself, he has worked hard to be who he is, but also one who preaches about it and teaches it to others. You don't, just don't want to keep it to yourself. The mouth of a tzaddik utters wisdom, knowledge. In other words, he talks about it, he teaches it to others. His tongue speaks justice. Also an important idea that part of being a tzaddik is not just behaving yourself, doing things right yourself, but sharing it with others, guiding others, teaching it to others. Why? Why is that so important? Because if you're really tzaddik, then you should be caring about others. You should care and you should want that there should be more and more people in this world that do the right thing. <laughs> if you don't not try, you don't want. That means you don't care. What kind of a tzaddik are you then? So a very important concept is that Pete Sadiq Yehgeh Chochman, he not only behaves himself, he also teaches others and wants others to, to be like him. Torat Elohav belibo lotim ad ashurav. Beautiful pasuk. That a real tzaddik has the Torah of his God in his heart. And therefore, all his steps that he takes do not falter in his heart. What does that mean? It's what we would call in English genuine, a genuine person, sincere person, not a faker at all. He's so real that the Torah is in his heart. Okay, but I would think every tzaddik is genuine, otherwise why call him a tzaddik? I mean, a tzaddik means that he's for real. So it means more than that. It doesn't only mean one who's really genuine. It means that the Torah is constantly in his heart. He's always thinking about it. So much so that the Yetzirah is completely subdued. The evil inclination is completely subdued. Because the evil inclination is completely subdued, therefore his steps do not falter. He doesn't make mistakes. People make mistakes sometimes. That's because the Torah is not completely in their heart or in their mind at all times. They're distracted. It can happen to anyone. So here he's telling us that such an individual who has the Torah of his God in his heart, you know, was continuously talking about it, practicing what he preaches, trying to become a better person. He's completely focused on it. He will be able to control his evil inclination and hopefully not make any mistakes, not falter. Okay, let's see just a few more verses. Sofer Rasha la tzaddik umivakesh lamito. This one is also fascinating. Because if you translate it literally, it's a little bit strange. It means like this, that the Rasha, the wicked man, is looking forward, looking out, to kill the tzaddik. He watches, the, he, the wicked man watches out for the righteous man. He wants to kill him. Really? Does every wicked man want to kill? Does every wicked man look out and see what his next chance will be to get this tzaddik? What does he want? Aren't there enough people out there that are minding their own business, hopefully? I mean, that's all he's thinking about is getting the tzaddik. The rabbis tell us this is not just a regular rasha. You know who this wicked guy is that works 24-7 to try to get the tzaddik? The Yitzhak. He, the evil inclination, yes, he's always out to get the tzaddik at all times. The greater one is, the more he wants to pursue him until he, at some point he gives up. He realizes that this tzaddik is just too strong. But he's not giving up completely. He doesn't retire. The Yitzhara is there until the person dies, the last second. So this is something that we have to contend with. This is the biggest enemy of mankind is the Yitzhara. 
he can be his own worst enemy. He doesn't realize that he has this constant enemy within him. The Yetzal, the evil inclination, that one Slami Ta, that's his job. He was created for that. You can't change the Yetzal. He wants to kill. He wants to prosecute you. He wants to catch you. But we're talking about a tzaddik now. So a tzaddik has proven himself to be a good person, a good soldier, right? He's devout. He's sincere. Then Hashem is just going to let that Yetzirah do whatever he wants? No, no, no. Adonai lo yazveno biyato veliyarshino biyashafeto. That's the next pasuk. It's a continuation in a sense. That Hashem will not abandon him in his hand. Will not let the Yetzirah trick him, catch him. Nor will he condemn him when he is judged later on. So what does this mean? Rabbis tell us a very important idea. Then one who's mezakeh harabim, one that helps others do mitzvot, he will not go to Gehenom so easily. He will not come to sin so easily. Why? Because it's not fair that his students, those that he was mekarev, those that he brought back, those that he strengthened and taught, they should be in Gan Eden in paradise and he should be in Gehenom for having committed a sin. It doesn't seem right. He's helped so many people. Just because he made a mistake, Hashem says, no, no, no. I'm not going to let him make such a mistake where he will end up because of that mistake in Gehenom. I will therefore protect him. He doesn't deserve to make a mistake. He doesn't deserve to commit a sin unintentionally. So that's the idea over here. Hashem lo velo yar In other words, you won't later on judge him. He won't condemn him. What does that mean? It means that he, he won't allow him to ever get to that point where he now has to judge him for what he did wrong. He's a tzaddik. He's trying to do his best. If a person is not careful, Hashem says, listen, you're not careful, I'm not going to protect you. I'm only going to protect those who, who watch out themselves. They watch out themselves, but you can trip sometimes. Sometimes we do things unintentionally because we weren't looking. Hashem protects. But if one does not protect himself, does not take any measures to protect himself, just doesn't care, goes to all kinds of places which are very unclean, and sees all kinds of things that are not proper to be seen, what do you expect? That Hashem should close his eyes? That Hashem should pretend? <laughs> he's doing it to himself. But if he's a tzaddik, he's really trying his best, then Hashem will not let him fall in the hands of the Yetzirah, will not let him come to this situation where he will later have to be accused of doing a wrong. Very important idea. How much protection is accorded to tzaddikim. And another saying by the rabbis also applies here that <clears throat> Hashem will never give you a load that you can't carry. If He gave you a load, if He gave you a particular struggle, a job which is complicated and difficult to do, it's because He knows you can handle it. He will never demand of you something that you cannot possibly do. There's no reason for Him to do that for you. So therefore, if something is too much, Hashem will get involved and not allow it to happen. Otherwise, you know, we would never succeed. There's so much we can handle. Hashem knows exactly how much each individual can handle, and that's how much He gives him. That's how much of a challenge He will give him. Next pasuk: Kave el Adonai Shmor Darko, Viromim Chala Reshet Aretz Bi Karet Reshaim Tire. Hope in Hashem, Kave el Hashem, hope in Hashem and keep His way, and He will raise you high to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see. Very long pasuk. And he's telling us that there's something very, very special about kaveh, hope. Sometimes a tzaddik is in trouble. For whatever reason. What will get him out of this trouble is kaveh, his hope. He's not lost hope in Hashem. He still trusts in Him. He doesn't second guess God. He doesn't complain. Just the Kaveh alone can be very powerful. It's a form of prayer, but it's more than prayer. It's not just praying to God. It's not just talking to Him. He's really hoping and He's really trusting that everything is for the good. Everything will come out right. 
this kaveh el Hashem is therefore very important. If after all, even though you are righteous, still something happened, it could happen even to the best, and you're in prison, or ill, chaz shalom, or some other trouble, just don't lose your hope. Don't lose your trust in Him. Still continue to observe the mitzvot. A lot of people came from the Holocaust to this country and they dropped everything. They said, where was God? I don't know if He's still around. They lost their hope, they lost their trust, they lost that connection. We can't blame them, we don't know what we would do. If they were. Nobody's here to blame anyone. I'm just trying to point out a fact that many people were not strong enough to be able to understand that this was a challenge, that this was a terrible decree, that eventually we will come out of it. And they did, they survived. Don't you, why not, why not look at the fact that you survived? Isn't that a miracle that God protected you, even though not everybody made it? They were focusing on the negative instead of the positive. Look at yourself, you survived, be thankful. God watched over you. And everyone who survived the Holocaust, we have a tradition that two angels watched over him at all times. So this is not something to take lightly. So you have complaints? You survived. But anyway, people react differently to all kinds of pressures. And when it comes to something like the Holocaust, it was a very powerful storm. And what they saw with their own physical eyes was so terrible that, you know, we can't understand what they went through. But still, they, they made the decision to drop everything. They didn't have to. They should be full of hope to continue Shmordako to observe his commandments. And if you do so, after all, and despite the difficulties, Viromimcha, he will in the end elevate you to inherit the land, and it was to, to settle down. And you will perhaps even merit Bihikaret Rishayim Tir'eh. You will see it with your own eyes how they will be cut off, the wicked ones. Because many times we don't see it. When did we see it? Today we can even see it uh, because it's recorded. There's recorded media of the Nuremberg trials, which fits in with the next Pasuk. You know who was tried in Nuremberg? The biggest Nazis, right? And that's what the next Pasuk talks about. Ra'iti rasha aritz. He says, I've seen very powerful, wicked people. Not just wicked people, but they were powerful in high positions. Well, what could happen to him? He says, I, I saw wicked people who were very powerful, and they were so powerful, they were like, umit areke ezrach ra'anan. It's a little bit of a difficult word, but what it means is that they were so rooted like a well-established tree that's been around for 50 years. Gezrach means like a fresh, strong tree that's already been there for a long time. It's roots, deep roots. So I've seen wicked, powerful people who are very, in English they would say, very well-placed, right? And you know what happened? And just not too much after I've saw, I saw them, they vanished. And I looked for him, and he's not to be seen. So I began to think about Nuremberg. These guys were in the high positions. They controlled tremendous amount. They held a tremendous amount of power. They wanted to conquer the world. They almost conquered all of Europe. And what would you think of them? Oh, they're going to stay like that in that position? Just a couple of years. It was only a couple of years. But no one would know of it from the beginning. Powerful Rashaim. They're judged in Nuremberg. Many of them were hanged. That's what he says. This repeated itself many, many times throughout history. Where people who may have been in the highest and most powerful positions at the end, when you looked around, he's gone in all kinds of ways, they were gone. There are many, many examples like that. People that be, became sick all of a sudden, people that were toppled, assassinated, overthrown. I mean, <laughs> incredible. It's so funny, but people don't read history. You don't understand that history repeats itself over and over again. Pasuk Lamed Zayn, Shmor Tamur Eyashar Kiachrit Shalom. Watch for the innocent. Observe those who are upright. These are the ones you want to look at. They're not going to vanish. If, if there's anybody to look for, 
anybody to look at the innocent, the upright people, the good people. To these people, you will see that the future is of peace. Whereas, But when it comes to sinners, they will be destroyed together. The future of the wicked will be cut off. So if you follow the Hebrew, you may actually have some fun with this. Because even though there are synonyms, synonyms meaning similar words, they really mean a little bit differently. They don't have the exact same meaning. Here we have Poshayim. And we have Rashaim, we have sinners and the wicked. Anybody know what the difference between wicked and sinners is? I mean, they sound like the same, but they're not. Then why not just lump them into one word? He's saying that the Posh'im, which are the sinners, Nishmedu, will be destroyed together. And Ahrit Rashaim, the end of the wicked, didn't say sinners, will be cut off. So, what's the difference between the wicked, the sinners? What does it mean to be destroyed together? The first part of the Pasuk talks about Posh'im Nishmedu Yachdav. There are times when the sinners will be destroyed together. Destroyed happens at once. Destruction, complete destruction, no time to reflect, all of a sudden they're gone. Ahrit Rashaim, the end. What does the end mean? The end means that it's being prolonged, it's being postponed. It's only the end of the life of the wicked is to be cut off, not to be destroyed. If you analyze it a little bit deeper, you will see that what this is referencing is a situation where sometimes Hashem gives a rasha, a chance. I'll give you 20 years. Why? Why would a Rasha get 20 years? Take him away right away. You don't know, you don't realize that this guy may eventually do Teshuvah, first of all. Hashem doesn't want to just kill people. As the Prophet says, I would rather they return to me than kill them. Hashem knows that there's a chance that he will return and he lets him. Or it could be that one of his children will be a righteous man, yet to be born. So why take him before that child is born? Hashem knows all these things. We don't know. We don't understand His ways. But I just gave you a couple examples of why Hashem may allow Reshaim to continue to living. And in the end, of course, if they don't correct their ways, Harit, the end will be that they will be cut off. Either here or in the world to come. In other words, they will not succeed for too long. There are times, however, Pushim Nishmedu Yachdav, together in war, completely destroyed. And others not so far, others not so fast. It may take more time, but there's a reason for that. Very important pasuk as well, but the teshu'ah of the righteous, the, the deliverance, the saving of the righteous will come from Hashem. From who else? Well, don't make the mistake of thinking that it's Uncle Sam or some other uncle. The Teshua of Tzadikim is directly from Hashem. Hashem sends it. He has all kinds of messengers. But Tzadikim are helped directly from Hashem. Why do they have that special direct assistance? Ma'uzan be'etzara, because Hashem was always their strength. They always turned to Him when they were in trouble. So it doesn't really explain, well, what does that mean that the help will come directly from Hashem. But it basically means that they will see it. It will be evident. It will be even in a miraculous way. The, the greater a person is in his righteousness, in his belief in Hashem, he sees, he experiences the hand of Hashem much more. That's because it's all proportionate to how much one believes. The more emunah and bitachon that one has, the more faith and trust in one has in Hashem. We've explained that various times. The, the clearer it will be to him, that he's being helped from above. It couldn't be any other way. It's not, how did this happen? All of a sudden, when things were so bleak, all of a sudden, a miracle occurred. No. Because they trust in Hashem. They see it more, with greater clarity. 
And the last pasuk of the Perek, Vayazrem Avonai, Vayifaletem, Yifaletem Reshaim, Yoshayim, Kichasu Vo. And Hashem will help them and deliver them. He delivers them from the wicked. He saves them from those who are wicked. And He will save them because they have put their trust in Him. So interesting here that He tells us the word faletem. By faletem means to deliver them or to save them, but in, not in a regular way of saving an individual, but more in a way of him avoiding the trouble to begin with. There's a big difference between, imagine being on a plane, the plane crashes, and the guy survives, versus, oh, I missed the flight. I got caught up in traffic. Which one is better? Huh? The miracle of the plane crashing and individuals staying alive is a bigger miracle. But the better miracle is not having to be on the plane to begin with, the trauma. That's called Vayifalletim. In other words, he makes them avoid. That's a higher level. To avoid the potential trouble. In other words, because when there is Midat Adin, according to our tradition, when there's Midat Adin, the attribute of justice is very, very powerful. And many people are dying of the bubonic plague, for example. Something that's, a, that's affecting a lot of people, millions of people. Hashem has to make here a plita. In other words, I have to make him run away from this, to, for him to avoid this. To make him be there and nothing happens to him is too big of a miracle. So Hashem sends him out of town just in time. See what I mean? So midata din, the attribute of justice, the angel of death should not catch on to him. And he will also make them be saved from the hands of the Rashaim too, the Yoshi'im. It was either to be directly saved from the Rasha's hands, from, and unfortunately throughout history there were many Rashaim, many kinds of troubles, the kings, dictators, where the Jew needed to be saved directly from that Rasha. Or it was a matter of avoiding the situation altogether. Anyway, so he ends up the Perek that the reason why the Tzaddik was given this kind of protection of being able to avoid all the troubles, all the misery, all the, the, or the calamity, whatever it may be, is ki hasuvo, because they trusted in him. Once again, we're given that word, even though hasu is a slightly different word than bitachon, one means to rely, one means to trust, they're very similar, the, the idea is still the same. When you put your trust in Hashem, you will see open miracles. Hashem will make it that you avoid altogether the dangers that others would have faced otherwise. So this is an extra merit. There's a lot of tzaddikim. There's a lot of good people out there. What makes the difference sometimes between one tzaddik and another is that one has a greater bitachon, greater trust in Hashem, and that can make a world of a difference on him avoiding the trouble to begin with. The segula of this perek, every perek, every chapter in Tehillim has a special segula, special power of protection. This chapter, as well as many other chapters, is for any situation which is difficult, any kind of a struggle, any kind of a problem, this perek can be said. But it's also interesting that this perek is also used to help somebody who's drunk, <laughs> believe it or not, yeah. It's brought down that this chapter, this particular chapter, can be very helpful to get him out of that. So regardless of the situation, uh, when somebody is in some sort of problem, when someone is in some sort of trouble, there are various pedakim to be said, and as I've said many, many times, reading Tehillim on a regular basis, not necessarily one particular or specific chapter, is already tremendous help of protection for the individual, and as a prayer, if somebody's already in a, in a big, problem to be able to get out of it. Tehillim is very concentrated, very, very powerful prayers. The problem is people read it, they don't even understand what they're saying. It's okay, but if they understood it, it would be so much better because they would be uplifted. They would not only get this protection from Hashem, they would feel so much better, they would be more confident, and without Hashem, their trust in Hashem will also become stronger.